what do we do with this anger? What do we do with this momentum? Does it really mean having a female president? Is that change? Or, you know, has this signaled to us that it has to go so much deeper and so much further than symbolic change or one change at the top? I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Racked and Kobo. We make e-readers and apps, we sell e-books and audiobooks, we build a lot of technology that helps people spend more time reading, but in our hearts, we are booksellers and readers. So when we have a chance to bring authors to the Kobo offices, I get to bring them to our studio here in Liberty Village, Toronto, to learn a bit about their careers, their creative process, and their reading and writing lives. And hopefully, you will too. Welcome to Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is Lorraine McKeon. She was editor of this magazine, was previously digital editor of The Walrus magazine, and is now deputy editor of Reader's Digest. She's the author of F-Bomb, Dispatches from the War on Feminism, which was shortlisted for the 2018 Kobo Emerging Writers Prize, and I am looking forward to speaking with her about her new book, No More Nice Girls, Gender, Power, and why it's time to stop playing by the rules. Loren, welcome to Kobo. Thank you for having me. This book in some ways feels like a pulse check on where we are now and where we're going in women's fight for equality, safety, power, agency. And we're sitting in this you know, beautiful foam line studio just a couple of days after the verdict came down on Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. in New York. Uh, convicting him on two out of three charges of sexual assault. You now that feels like a bit of a milestone or a bit of a bookend to this book. Were there particular thoughts that came up when that uh, ruling came down for you? Yeah, I honestly, I almost cried at my desk. <laughs> I was very, you know, emotional about it because I think, and maybe this is too cynical of me, but I really truly believed that he would be found not guilty because We've just seen, you know, in the past two years, so much fury from women and so much anger and so much demand for change. And it's been fueled by decisions going the other way. You know, when we saw Brett Kavanaugh, when we've seen even, you know, here in Canada, when we've seen some other, you know, trials that might not have ended the way that a lot of people um, hoped or expected or we haven't seen people be held accountable. So it almost seemed like it would never happen. Mm -hmm. And to see it happen, it is just the very beginning of, you know, things that need to change and people that do need to be held accountable and systems that need to change. But it's almost like at last we've seen that it can happen and it was just this moment of emotion at my desk uh, with no one around me and thankfully no one saw me but I'm sure they would have would have understood if they had. And that pessimism you describe is well founded. You talk about in your book and we've had Robin Doolittle in here as mm -hmm. well talking about the research that she's done around sexual assault in women like the numbers were not on the accuser's side in this case or in any cases that come up related to sexual assault. Did that feel to you like a sign of things changing or does it feel like an outlier and what's still a very pessimism filled process? I think it depends on which day you catch me on how I will answer mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. because, you know, in some ways it can be such a signal for hope. You know, here is the beginning. Here is this very high profile case where as you said, had every right to be pessimistic that he would be found not guilty. So in some ways, it feels like the right thing happened or, you know, I think if it had gone the other way, it really would have felt like just another deflation in this movement that, um, you know, a lot of people think is very important. And I mean the Me Too movement, but also just the movement of, around systemic change. Mm -hmm. But I think on the other side, it is one case, you know, albeit a high profile case, um, but it is only one case. And there are so many people that feel they can't come forward, whose cases, you know, have never made it that far. There are people who 
you know, don't have that profile and things have not gotten better for them yet. And I think a lot of what I look at in my book is this idea that, you know, there's this idea of symbolism. And I think the Weinstein case is very symbolic, but there's also the stickier and more complex <laughs> layers of power and what that means. And I don't think anything fundamentally yet has changed, but it certainly doesn't hurt <laughs> to see what looks like justice. You describe that tension several times throughout the book of, on one hand, symbolic progress being inspiring, being motivating, being something that allows people to have something to shoot towards, and then overwhelming statistics on the other side mm -hmm. that suggest that that is an outlier, that is a special case. The amount, the number of barriers and you know, the complexity of that labyrinth, as you, know, as you describe it, is as big and as daunting as it's ever been. Yeah, my hesitation to totally celebrate the Weinstein case is because I fear that people will say, look, the system does work. And I don't really think the system does work. And I think mm -hmm. for many people who have survived sexual violence, it doesn't work for them and it won't work for them. And, you know, I think there's a lot of danger historically and even now we hold up, you know, these big symbolic victories and they are important. And I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate them. But in a lot of cases, it is seen as an end point when I think it's really only the beginning. One of the ongoing themes in this book that I pulled out was the sort of one step forward, one step back nature of progress in, you know, in all kinds of social movements. But with feminism particularly, you describe, for example, that after Me Too, our understanding of consent went backwards compared to 2015. Are data points like that because we realize that the issues are more complex than we thought they were? You know, when we talk about something like understanding of consent going backwards, is that because if you'd asked someone in 2015, they would have gone, oh yeah, I, you know, I know what consent is, and now we know it's more nuanced and, and more complex than we thought? Or is it just things swinging backwards as people push back? I mean, I'd like to think it's that we're realizing <laughs> that things are more complex. Are we back to your optimistic day, pessimistic <laughs> yeah. day? But I do okay. think, you know, there's a lot of research that has been shown that would suggest that maybe we do not have cause to be as optimistic because, you know, we've seen that when women advocate for their rights and when we see these surges in you know feminist activism and women's rights activism that they're often met with backlash which is why we sort of have seen you know if you stretch back it's almost this roller coaster or a cyclical kind of movement where you see people fighting for rights and you see them get some of those rights and then you see the backlash come and sort of stomp it back down mm -hmm you know, starting Susan Faludi described it in Backlash, you know, her book where she talks about how that happened in the 80s. And I think that we're seeing a little bit of that. The research does show that in talking about consent and in acknowledging that it is complex and there are many, you know, there's coercion. We don't talk about coercion a lot. People still have this very old, <laughs> idea of what consent looks like and what sexual assault looks like and all that sort of things. I think in talking about it, you know, a lot of people are just like, well, you know, it's almost this like, oh, well, now you just have to ask yes for everything. You can't flirt. And you see a lot of this pushback and this real aversion to change. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, part of it is actually coming from that too, which is disappointing. But we are talking about it, which is a huge change. And that does make me feel optimistic. You had finished up your previous book, F-Bomb, and we're starting to think about this new book, No More Nice Girls. What were the things that you wanted to try and bring together? What were the questions that you wanted to make sure got answered as you were, uh, as you were assembling this book? Mm -hmm, yeah, so F-Bomb finishes right at the Women's March on Washington. So that is, you know, it's the like end point. <laughs> it is, yeah. and you yeah. know, I think at that time, no one 
really knew what would happen. And it's so interesting when I started researching F-bomb and I remember saying, you know, we're in this point and I can see the anti-feminist movement rising. I could see Donald Trump winning and people were like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, we're not there. People wear feminist t-shirts, you know, there's feminism on their pencil cases we're or whatever, now, you know, yeah. it's, it's cool to be a feminist now. And I said, you know, I don't really think so. I think we're in that backlash moment. So when we had the Women's March on Washington, it, for a lot of people, it was like this wake up call because they were in this moment where they were like, feminism has won, you know, we're, we're there. Everyone's a feminist now. Mm -hmm. And then they started to see. And just wait, we're going to have a female president. Yes, it's going to be right. Great. <laughs> you know, people had really, a lot of people had really lived in almost a sort of, you know, happy denial that there was this anger and this backlash bubbling up. So, you know, F bomb ended there, and then I started touring it. And when I was touring that, people were becoming so much more, you know, active and awake and engaged. And the questions were okay, we're angry. But now what? What do we do? How do we change this? What would that actually look like? That's a huge question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, one mm -hmm. book can't answer that. And I think there will be many books and many important books that will come out on this subject. But part of what I wanted to look at when I started was actually looking at anger. And as it turned out, many books have come out then since and were rushed to, you know, to respond mm -hmm. and put to press, you know, earlier than anticipated. So it was the question of what do we do with this anger? What do we do with this momentum? Does it really mean having a female president? What, is that change? Or, you know, has this signaled to us that it has to go so much deeper and so much uh, further than symbolic change or one change at the top? What are other ways of power? What are other things that we need to look at? How can we kind of start an undoing of everything we mm -hmm. think we know? You know, because we've seen we can be wrong on this mass scale. So what would it look like to think of other ways? One of the things that struck me reading the book is that it is it is sprawling in scope. Like you are you really are it's almost a a kaleidoscope of the different facets of what this movement of change means, both the points of resistance to it and the places where you can be optimistic, the individual personal examples and broader societal shifts and then each chapter is its own little slice of that mm -hmm. that, that goes through it which I found both fascinating in terms of the number of different perspectives that you were able to bring to it and at the same time holding the whole thing in my head was you know was almost dizzying in the sense <laughs> that, you know, just in the sense that okay you know, we're talking about economics on one side. Yes. We're talking about individual spaces. We are talking about social movement theory. We are talking about you know, what it means to be a young girl in 2019. Like it is, mm -hmm. it's a constant switching of focus and context. And so when you were starting to put it together, did you have a sense of you know, the kind of experience that you wanted someone to have as they were going through it? I think that in a way, I wanted it to echo what I felt a lot of people were feeling, which is just the questions that people had about their own lives and the way that they wanted to tackle it. You know, for some people coming to this realization that things are really messed up and, you know, there's an imbalance that runs so much deeper than politics or that might run so much deeper than X number of women CEOs in Canada or the pay gap, you know, for a lot of people, it became almost like a domino effect, which is kind of like that kaleidoscope. It was like, well, I feel like I don't have power here. And that's really opened up how I might not have power here. <laughs> and, you know, and then I realized, you know, this is connected to that. It was really this kind of eyes wide open moment. And I think that, you know, it can feel like you have that. And, you know, and I think it's important to look at how it's all connected but it kind of feel like that makes you immobile. Like, what do you do now? There's so many things that are interconnected. And I wanted to show that, okay, if maybe you want to, maybe you're an artist or you're, you're a creator and you don't want to run for office and that's not something that you want to do, but maybe you can shift the balance of power just in your day-to-day -day life, how you direct your movie, who you hire, you know, what your work environment is like. All of these things are just little ways that we can start to move and question the way things have always been. So I wanted someone to see that it's okay if you can't do it all. 
even though here I'm going to give you all the information, but it's okay <laughs> if you can't do it all. But what could you do? And what in your own life can you do to shift power or move power or think of leadership and success differently? And let's talk about power for a second, because you have a section of the book that's almost a meditation on the different kinds of power mm -hmm. and the different shapes that it takes. Why was it important to, to lay that out for people in the book? What I learned when I interviewed people, and I interviewed many, many people for this book because I did want to push back past the idea that power is just politics or power is just business, you know, these mm -hmm. very traditional ways that we think of power and change. Or just the ability to tell people to do things. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just being able to, you know, say something and yeah, people mm -hmm. will do it. But what I learned when I started talking about power to people is that everyone defines it differently. There are so, you know, people have, yes, maybe this idea of, you know, white man in a suit and tie yelling at people, you know, but for other people, it might look very different and they might already be thinking of power differently, you know, in terms of community activism. Maybe motherhood might be power to them. You know, maybe being able to have control over their own lives or their own bodies might look like power. So I wanted to acknowledge that it is incredibly difficult to define what it means. And even talking to people that study power, I remember interviewing one person and just asking him like, am I way off base here? Is this really hard to define? He was like, I've spent my whole career trying to define it, you know? And you, there's this whole study and people have historically been unable to sort of grasp what it means because it can mean power over a group. It can mean power over your own life and your own decisions. It can mean, you know, power to enact change, power over social movement. And in a way that's confusing, but in a way I think it's also incredibly freeing because it leaves us so much room to redefine and reimagine what success and power can look like for people who maybe haven't traditionally felt like they've had it. Mm -hmm. And you describe the scene so well talking about Christine Blasey Ford, mm -hmm. where you know, even in the face of confronting an accuser and not having the effect that she was hoping for, not being able to stop that nomination, there was power in speaking truth to power, in yes. asking those hard questions, in forcing that hard conversation. And it's not maybe the kind of power that we would like, but it doesn't make it less impactful and it is another kind it almost feels like we need more words for it <laughs> for you know for the many different variations that show up mm -hmm. you describe me too not just as a force for change or a mechanism for finding people who have done wrong and holding them to account but as a force for healing and i was wondering if you could talk a bit about that Mm -hmm. You know, I spoke to a lot of people who um, maybe had come forward before Me Too and had had a very different experience and a very different public reaction. But I also went to events, you know, held post, well, not post Me Too, because we're still ongoing, but, mm -hmm. you know, during this time when it seemed like everyone was talking about it. And it's interesting when you push past, you know, everything that you see in the headlines. And when you push past maybe your own little bubble on social media, a lot of people who have been sexually assaulted or raped or have experienced maybe just, you know, not just, but maybe experienced harassment at work, the whole spectrum of what it can mean. They looked at it and said, you know, this attention is great. The focus of the conversation is great, but how does that help me in my day-to-day -day life? What does that mean for me? And what if I'm not ready to speak up? Or what if I am ready to speak up? You know, it's, it's just the experience, not no one survivor is the same. So when you look at it from this idea of healing, it's not, am I going to take X powerful man down or I have to, you know, take X celebrity down or take my boss down or whatever that might be. It might look at being you know, I feel supported by other women around me. Um, maybe, you know, it's an opportunity to disclose and you've never disclosed before and that feels very healing for you. Maybe it means your workplace is looking at a better policy or even enacting a policy or starting those conversations. 
in a lot of cases, you know, we think that survivors want justice and that justice looks like the Weinstein case. It looks like going to court. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, that's not what they want. Maybe they want a way in to talk. You know, maybe they're looking at restorative justice where they want to talk to the person who assaulted them because maybe it's someone they know, someone they cared about at one point. Maybe what they really want is an apology or an acknowledgement. And I think that what Me Too has done is opened door not just for punishment which is what the focus has been on but for this sort of reckoning of a conversation of putting survivors to the front allowing them to talk to each other without you know the system in the way um, you know without the conversation always revolving around justice and what that means and has allowed them to determine for themselves what these things will look like and that can be incredibly healing to someone who feels like their own power has been taken away from them one of the other areas that you talk about in terms of empowerment of women was a, a term that I'd never heard before that you describe as the confidence industry. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the confidence industry. And it's so prevalent right now. And when we talk about everyone being a feminist, I think a lot of what we're talking about is what I would say would fall under the idea of the confidence industry. So, you know, when people say, you know, I'm a boss bitch, or, you know, I'm the, you go girl, you got this, <laughs> or, you yep, know, this yeah. kind of, you know, things that look like affirmations and look like good things from the surface. And sometimes they are, and maybe they are, you know, for some people, and confidence is not a bad thing, but I think it kind of sets us up for a trap because a lot of times it's commercialized. You know, I think of the commercial with Serena Williams that was like really shared and people were like, yes, I feel so empowered, but it's also like, go buy some shoes. <laughs> and I think, you know, the danger of commercializing this is one, it's, you know, it's companies that are telling you what equality and power looks like. And, you know, it's good for them for stepping up, but they have a motivation and that motivation is also to sell you things. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. But I think the other thing is that it totally ignores all the systemic barriers. So when you say, I can't get a job or I can't get ahead at work or, you know, I can't make my bills meet and someone is just like, you go girl, you got this, <laughs> you know, that's all not helpful confidence. to you. <laughs> yeah. And I've heard that, you know, in, in the reporting that I've done and the events that I've attended, you know, I've heard people you know, talk about this and these are the systemic barriers I'm facing and I'm facing racism and I'm facing maybe homophobia, transphobia. And for someone to come back and say, well, you just need to be more confident. That's putting a lot of it back on you and not talking at all about all the various ways in which the system really is stacked against you. And, you know, we're buying into that in a way that is not helping other people. Mm -hmm. It's not very collective, but it's also not really challenging the power game. It's just like the best will rise up right. and the more confident you are, you got it. And you who cares what anyone else? You work super hard and yeah. you'll just crash right through it. Yeah. So should Nike not run that ad? Should they not express that sentiment? Or is the hope that there's something more nuanced that fits into that same space? I think the hope is there's something more nuanced because I think the challenge is almost like a yes and. So yes. You know, I would rather see a commercial that is not sexist than one that is. I and mean, we know commercials have been and still are incredibly sexist. So I'd rather see one, you know, that is on the right side of that. But I think the challenge then becomes we all feel good and Nike feels good and Nike looks good, um, but nothing changes. So who do we really, you know, can we leave these conversations and this idea of how far we've come in the hands of someone whose vested interest is just to get us to buy more stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the challenge becomes. And I think that in the same way that, you know, one female CEO at the head of the company runs the danger of us being like, we've made it. Seeing a c commercial like that also runs the danger of just making us feel good, but not leaving space to discuss all the ways in which it's more complex than that. It's more mm -hmm. complex. And I think we're at this point where we have an opportunity to talk about how much more complex it is and people want to. 
And then separately, or you're kind of pulling on one of those themes a bit, you talk a fair bit about when women do get to the top, when they, you know, the ones that do manage to crash through, navigate the labyrinth, like, call their way up. It's not that great at the top either if uh, you know, to be a woman who's reached the top of some of those power structures. Right. It's almost like you lose no matter what. You lose even when it looks like you're winning often. And the reason for that is because we put a lot of investment in making it to the top and thinking, okay, I've played the game perfectly. I've you know, clawed through, I'm at the top now, this is what equality looks like, I am here, I have done it, look everyone else, you can do it too, and things are good. But the research doesn't really support that at all. And a lot of the reason is because when you make your way to the top and you've played by the rules, oftentimes you haven't changed company culture at all. And we'll often see what happens is that there will be a woman at the top and maybe at the very top, you know, a CEO or on the C-suite. And then there are still not very many women below her or below her in management. So there's no support and there's no structural change. And often, rather than being able to make that structural change, she becomes a target for people that don't want to see her at the top, you know, with all that power. And some of the studies are just mind-blowing. You know, you look and you see if you're at the top as a woman, you're actually more likely to be sexual harassed, sexually harassed. And you think, that doesn't make any sense. But then if you pause and think about it, you're like, well, no, it does, because it's about power. And someone doesn't maybe want to see you have that power and you have a bigger target. You know, you're more likely to be fired because it's easy to be like, well, she can hack it. <laughs> Let's hear, you know. And there's so much that hasn't um, changed that, or that is still ingrained in us that until that changes, continuing to play by these same rules and have the same definition of success really isn't getting us anywhere. And other studies have shown that when those things do change, when there are more women at the bottom too, in the middle management, that is when things start to change. It's when the whole system shifts that we actually see the change that we're looking for happen. Some of the statistics you brought forward around female CEOs were especially illuminating. You know, women's greatest chance of being hired into a CEO role is during a time of crisis, when the company's in trouble, which then both means that they are already at higher risk of getting fired on the other side or mm -hmm. being replaced by another white man on the other side if things don't turn around the way that people want. But the one that shocked me was that they are also more likely to be fired when things are going well. So yes. <laughs> you, <laughs> that they're, you know, even that, that stock performance and company performance didn't really correlate to whether uh, a woman who was a CEO was going to be replaced or not. And uh, that was especially eye-opening to me because I mean, we, you know, I think we've heard a lot that there are greater expectation on women as leaders. There's, you know, all of that push and pull of discounting skill sets and emphasizing faults. Mm -hmm. But I guess there'd always been that meritocratic hope that if you're generating good performance for the company, that means you get to keep your job. But it doesn't even seem like that's the case. No, and especially depressing because it's not just one outlying study that shows this, you know, <laughs> it's study after study. <clears throat> and then if you look you know, even just that real life examples, you can see it. And it's almost this idea, or a lot of researchers think it's this idea where it's like, okay, we're doing good. Now we can get someone like really dynamic in. <laughs> that person will be a man. You know, it's just, we have these qualities associated with women that often put women at the losing end of things. So, you know, everything's stable, but you know, now that it's stable, like let's really try and get some growth in there and let's really try and see what we can do. And that means, you know, we're going to hire this uh, person with a big personality and often it's the same type of leader that we've always had. So it's and the, just- And the one who wouldn't say yes when the company's in trouble, but will now say yes, now yes. it's fine. Yes. As a, almost a counter to that, you describe the possibility of women-only spaces and as well as the idea of 
companies that are built from first principles with women at the center of it. And one of the things I found very interesting was, while you describe contemporary versions of it, you also talk about the history of women's mm -hmm. clubs and women creating their own spaces, going you know, back to the suffrage movement and before. Is that something that you think we could use more of today? Are there ways that we could be building company with women's needs at the center of it that would benefit businesses overall? The more diverse your business is, the more diverse perspectives you will have, and you know, the more agile you might be when you're problem solving or when you're thinking of new ideas or you're trying to reach a set of customers that maybe you know you don't have represented at all in your company. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes for women, but it goes for people of color, it goes for people with disabilities, you know, the whole lack of diversity is harmful in companies. And I think when it comes to women's only spaces. We've seen it again and again, historically, as a response to moments like this where gender relations and gender conversations are very um, heightened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen women often opt out, you know, when they're, when they're speaking and advocating for their rights, we've seen them opt out in the 20s, yes, when we had women's suffrage, we saw it in the 60s, women opted out then, you know, we keep seeing it happen. It's been a, quite a common response. And I think it should only be a temporary response because I think, yes, ultimately the goal is to figure out how to emulate those principles and maybe that different way of doing business or thinking about leadership, which is often something that's more collaborative. It's often something that's more diverse, uh, welcomes more perspectives to the table, maybe has structured the company differently. And I think the trick is to create those spaces, but then invite everyone in. Mm -hmm. And I think there are places that are doing it and there are places now that, you know, are trying to reverse engineer that, which is a little bit more tricky because it's very hard to change a whole company culture. I think, you know, a lot of the companies that we're seeing that have success right now are the ones that started with those principles and maybe it is a small group of women, but they're growing more and more and more and expanding outward and those principles have always been there. Mm -hmm. You've been charting the struggle of women for equality for many years, both as an author and as an editor. What have you seen change since Me Too in that movement? Are there things that you've learned or that have surprised you over the last three years compared to you know, the, the time that came before? Are there more sudden shifts that you've noticed or that you've picked up on in the last few years? I think that people are more willing to talk about it and I think that media is more willing to tackle it <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know give space to it but I do think that sometimes it's hard to decide um, sometimes it feels like an avalanche <laughs> I think mm -hmm. you know as a reader it's very hard to sift through that avalanche of coverage. And I think that's sometimes where we might see a backlash come or where we might see people kind of tune it out. Because even if you're invested in these issues, it can be very hard to hear day after day after day to be reminded of you know, your trauma or someone else's trauma. That's exhausting too. So I think you know, as an editor and a writer, I'm so happy there's more of an appetite for it. But I think we have to figure out different ways to cover it and approach the conversation because I don't think the endless cataloging of horrible things is all that should be happening. I think we should start thinking about where we go now and what different models of power look like. I think we can start talking about different ideas of justice and what restorative justice looks like and also talking about you know the the conversation and this predates me too but you know, we assume a very default white, straight conversation, even in feminism. And I think what's really changing is we're realizing very rightly that the conversation has to expand past that. And we can't only, as media, focus on this idea of who the perfect victim is. And we have to start telling these more complex stories. And because I think we're ready. I think we're ready to do that. I think of my own daughter just coming out of high school who is 
vocal and active and well-versed in intersectional feminism and has kind of grown up through this particular slice of feminist history. Coming out of your own research for the book, do you see any change in the mindset of young women who've grown up through this, kind of through this period of time and are now becoming the next wave of feminists who, who carry this forward? They give me so much hope. <laughs> I think they are amazing, yes. And I think, you know, for my last, for F-Bomb, uh, my first book, I interviewed many <laughs> young feminists and I remember people would show up at events and they would have started reading it and they'd be like, wow, this book is really depressing. And I'd be like, wait until you get to the end because I talked to the next generation of feminists and they will give you hope. And I think, you know, some of those ideas certainly are carried on in No More Nice Girls, where I also talk to young women at the end and you're seeing women certainly go into feminism with this intersectional approach, which is amazing. But you're also seeing people question the idea of gender and what it means and how that serves us and how it doesn't serve us. And it's this generation that is ready to be like, well, why have we always done it this way? And that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And let's try and change it. So I think that gives me so much hope. And I think, though, they're also facing very, very real challenges of also growing up in this hyper, this world is hyper attuned to how they look mm -hmm. and how they're always, you know, have to, their lives are very public. And I think that is a struggle that a lot of young teens face. And I've talked to many who, you know, do have that battle where they want to embody feminist ideals, but they're also, you know, living in this world that is not always kind to them. So I think, you know, it's up to us to help question that and, you know, mm -hmm. look at that and, you know, and change that stuff too. I remember speaking to a young feminist who told me just about the horrible sexual harassment she faced in high school. And she was like, I'm in a feminist now but when I started the school year, like I wasn't and I didn't even know what that meant. And I would never have said I was a feminist because this harassment would have been even worse. So I think we also have to be careful of assuming even at a young age now, even with so much change and so much positive change, that it's still easy to speak about these issues because I don't think it always is. Mm -hmm. This gives us a good segue to talk about younger Lorraine McKeon. <laughs> yeah. And and this is, these are some of the questions I get to ask each of the authors who comes on Kobo in conversation. What were some of the most formative books for you as a child? Well, I've always been a bit of a book nerd, and I guess a bit of a nerd <laughs> too. Just a just a straight nerd. Just, call it. Own <laughs> just it. a straight nerd. Yeah. So I think you know I really gravitated when I was young to books that took me out of the world, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. out of the world as we know it, and kind of did imagine different futures or different, you know, places, especially for young women. So I read, you know, a wrinkle, the Wrinkle in Time books over and over and over again. And then I read, um, of course, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and, you know, all of those which are very male heavy, but, you know, imagine different worlds and you can imagine yourself in them. I read a quirky little book called The Phantom Tollbooth over and over again, and I'm always delighted when I find other people that have read it, Bellers. because I feel like, yeah, yeah, I feel like it got forgotten <laughs> in that mm -hmm. period, you know, and Roald Dahl and, you know, these troublemakers. So I always gravitated to just anything with imagination, and, you know, often that meant else <laughs> but not always um and i think yeah like i just and i read so much i remember i was definitely one of those kids where their parents are like you know you gotta go outside you can't just like spend the whole summer reading a book you went to summer camp with your suitcase of books oh my gosh yeah. i hated summer camp i was like just let me go home and read <laughs> we didn't have tv either so it was just a whole we didn't have a computer my parents didn't think computers were going to catch on mm -hmm. so we were just you know it was the right environment to become a book nerd so growing up was there was there a first book that caught you in terms of your development as a feminist i think that when 
I was like young, young, mm -hmm. you know, I read, I always gravitated to word um, stories that had female protagonists. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that a lot of my own feminist awakening didn't really come until I took a gender studies class in high school. Because Good high school. <laughs> yeah, I was part of a, I didn't realize that was not normal. Like mm -hmm. I thought every high school had those and it wasn't until later on in life when I realized that's not true. And I discovered later on we had one teacher, a male teacher, who just pushed for it and created the curriculum so that we could take it. And that was sort of my awakening. And I, I was already thinking about sort of these things and, you know, noticing it in my own life. But it wasn't until I took that class that I started to sort of develop the language to talk about it or, you know, realized that there were other people that were also thinking about it because that's not always, especially when I was in high school, you know, there weren't a lot of young women getting together to talk mm -hmm. about feminism mm -hmm. and you had no sort of way. And it was kind of even considered then to be like a bird course, right? Like you took it because it would be an easy pass. And, mm -hmm. but there were a few of us that just, you know, dove right into it and went to the library and took out those books and took out other books. You know, all the classics, you know, the beauty myth, you know, reading all of, you know, the essays and all of that sort of stuff and those early feminist and bell hooks and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. And that was sort of the initiation into it. When did you first start to think of yourself as a writer as opposed to just being a reader? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think you know, it was something that I always wanted. We were going through, uh, my family and I were going through some of my old, or my mom had kept everything because she recently moved to BC. So we were going through all of the things that she had kept oh, while she was you downsizing. Have to do the <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you see all these little books that I made when <clears> I was <throat> a kid. It was like a story of a life of Loren McKeon. <laughs> And, you know, Excellent. there was like, I wrote a very embarrassing uh, origin story for myself when I must have been like seven or eight. Oh, tell me you saved it. Oh, it's there. Excellent. And, you know, we, you know, there's stories that I like, books that I made about people living in the clouds and someone living in a rainbow. So I think I always wanted to be a writer. But I think, you know, it, it takes a while to think of yourself that way because it's just hard to wrap your mind around sometimes. <laughs> You're mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I wrote a book and here it is. And it's a physical object. Yeah. But I think, you know, I've always wanted um, to be a writer. So which books were most impactful or most formative for you as you were becoming a writer, as you were starting to build that craft? Yeah, so I went to school for journalism, which was quite a shift from being someone who is very quiet in their own world, thinking about elves, and, you know, whatever mm -hmm. else, uh, to go and start, you know, talking to people and wanting oh to know God, about their lives. Oh my God, I'm going to have, to ask, have to ask people questions and I talk remember, to strangers. <laughs> yeah, we did a streeter on the first day, on the first day of journalism, and we were sent to the Eaton Center, and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> like, I just thought I would die if I had to talk to someone. But I think, you know, from there, just falling in love with what it means to tell someone else's story and the immense privilege that you have when someone lets you into their life and, um, you know, tells you <laughs> about their lives and their thoughts and lets you follow them around for maybe months. So I think, you know, the books that I started to read were just, I just like inhaled all of the kind of the journalism classics. So I really like John Krakauer, which is not feminist, although he's written a book about rape culture on campus mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. So now, but at the time it was mostly inventuring. And, but just the way he told a story and immersed himself into those stories and people's lives, I really admired. And then Susan Orlean, of course, who has just, you know, has written some of the best books and essays, I think, out there when it comes to character studies and, you know, what makes people tick and, you know, what are their motivations and really diving in and questioning. So that was, you know, a big thing. And then, you know, Mary Roach, who writes, I tend to gravitate, you know, also to people who don't write like I do, who don't write about feminism, because I think 
it's not the subject that I, I it's not of course I find feminism <laughs> interesting and important but I like reading people who write about things I don't know anything about so Mary Roche does a lot of science journalism and the way that she's able to describe it to people like me who don't really understand science <laughs> I just think is she's funny and you know she's enlightening and before you know it you've read like a whole book about corpses and you're like how did this happen and now I know so much about corpses. And now I know so much uh, you know so books like that and you're just like this is fascinating and then of course, there are feminist authors that I love. So Peggy Orenstein is one of them. Um, I think when I read Cinderella Ate My Daughter, I've read it so many times now, it's all like sticky noted up. And it was sort of, I guess, the first time I realized, because I made my journalism career not writing about feminism, but doing investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. Very, you know, there was a point where I was like, oh, I will never write about myself. When I read Cinderella Ate My Daughter, I realized you could be funny and write about feminism. You could be entertaining. You can tell a story. And I think, you know, moving and learning that was a huge part. It was very informative and it has sort of informed how I think about feminism and how I think about feminist storytelling. And then, you know, you go from there and there's Rebecca Traister who has written some amazing books and it just like kind of goes on and on. I have four bookshelves in my apartment, um, which is probably not surprising. <laughs> There's just, just packed with books. And actually, I was gifted a Kobo so that I would stop doing that. <laughs> so now my Kobo that's is a, just... That's a perfect <laughs> reason to have one. Filled with books, too, that's because right. it was just like, you need to stop. <laughs> And then you get to do that edit of the bookshelves to say, okay, like which you know, yes. I can either free up space or I can keep this as a like a permanent collection that I never touch again. Yeah. And that's the the constant conflict of full bookshelves. I have friends who are like, I never need to go to the library because I'll just come over to your house and borrow a book. <laughs> but you know, I think I just think stories are fascinating. There's just so much. So when you are sitting down to write No More Nice Girls were there books that you pulled on or books that you you went to as you were you know as you were going through that process so this i guess is the contradiction of me <laughs> is that when i actually sit down to write a book i don't read anything else mm -hmm. unless it's for reference and to write a book <laughs> is it just takes up so much of your brain it's almost like there's no space to read for fun <laughs> which mm -hmm. is you know sad but it is true so i think you know and i don't even really watch much tv you know it's wanting to focus right on the story and the narrative that you're telling but there were some books that informed some of the ideas and you know that are cited in the book so there's through the labyrinth um, which is by Alice Eagley, and I interviewed her for the book too. Um, but she talks a lot about how the path to women's success is not a straight line, it's a labyrinth, <laughs> and it, you know, it had touched on a lot of the things and the ideas that I've been thinking about um, and kind of dissuades us of thinking of the glass ceiling metaphor. Mm -hmm. And then I also read Empowered uh, by Sarah Benet Weiser, and it's that was recommended to me three times in one day. <laughs> um, from I had done all these interviews, and these sources were like, "It just came out. You have to read it," and it is immensely good. And it talks a lot about uh, sort of the confidence scam, <laughs> and okay. her ideas don't really feature very strongly in No More Nice Girls, but I just thought. It's a fascinating dive into how empowerment is sold to women without maybe not necessarily doing anything to empower women. And it's incredibly well researched. One of the things that I loved about this book were depth and breadth of interviews uh, within them. You, you talked to a lot of people as you were putting this together. Were there, were there some people that you uh, met or a particular interview that stands out as one where you had to leave a lot on the cutting room floor, so to speak, where there was just, you wish you could have put more in. Almost everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I think, I don't say that lightly. I think that I just talked to a lot of really fascinating people who had questioned, who had been questioning the idea of power and success and the way things are done and what those things look like, you know, through a lot of their life's work. 
And a lot of the conversations I had were, you know, hours long. And, we, you know, we would sit and talk for hours and maybe we would have a follow-up conversation. And when you have that and then you distill it into a few pages, you always feel like you wish you could tell so much more. And I think that a lot of these people I interviewed you know, have their own stories to tell outside of the way I've told it and, you know, the way it's in the book. And I think that I will read them gladly because there were so many fascinating people, people that had started their own, you know, women's only spaces to people that were making films, to people that were in the technology world. It is sort of, as you said, that kaleidoscope. And, you know, I didn't walk out of any interview. There was no interview I walked out of where I was like, wow, that was a dud everyone was doing such cool things and i think it's very indicative of the time we're in where people are just like forget the rules <laughs> forget what i'm supposed to do i'm going to do um, what i want to do and what makes me happy and that's incredibly inspiring there were a number of instances where you would open up a chapter focusing on a particular woman and and then using her uh, her experience to begin a conversation on a larger theme and the number of times where I'm like we can't go on to the larger theme yet. like <laughs> yeah. she's really interesting <laughs> let's, yeah. Yeah, let's spend a little more time here but it did it spoke to the richness of of those individual stories and it, it did feel like there could be a you know a companion volume of just the extra interviews that that went along with it because there were so many interesting stories there yeah, you know, I started and I was like, am I going to find, when I started researching, how many people am I going to find that are really doing power differently? You know, you always wonder that. And to my delight, <laughs> there were many, many people who were doing power differently. And, you know, they often, you know, one source would lead me to the next, to the next, to the next, um, because I think, you know, that's the moment that we're in. So aside from my personal request for a companion volume two with all of the, all of the outtakes, <laughs> what's next? Oh gosh. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not sure what I've been looking at and working on a lot is actually looking at boxing, a book on women's boxing. And I mentioned very, very briefly in No More Nice Girls that I box. And, you know, I want to look at and what I've been digging in is why I box and you know what that means because I also box competitively, so not just for fun, um, but also what that, you know, what that says about the idea of women's strength and their bodies and um, aggression and violence and how that and those things are changing and what that means and what that could look like and why we are seeing a revival sort of, of boxing, but in the women's sphere and, and why that is and um, what makes us get in the ring. As someone who also goes to the gym to do boxing on a regular basis and is usually in a room that is now probably 70 to 75 percent women, mm -hmm. it's uh, I cannot wait for that book too. I think that's going to be great. Loren, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I have been speaking with Loren McKeon as a part of Kobo in Conversation. McKeon's latest book is No More Nice Girls, Gender, Power, and why it's time to stop playing by the rules. You can find a link to that book, her previous book, The F-Bomb, the other books we have mentioned here, along with previous episodes of the podcast at kobo.com slash conversation. There are so many good authors there. Show up our self-esteem and our need for reassurance with a rating and a review, and also check out our sibling podcast, Kobo Writing Life, all about the nuts and bolts of making it as an independent author. And thank you for listening.